Does this work? Oh, there we go. It's on. Okay. Is everyone settled in? Sweet. Okay. So uh, my name is Keith McCann. I uh, should try not to look away from the mic. My name is Keith McCann. Um, I'm from KM Sick. I'm one of the silver sponsors this year. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's get started. To the, today's talk is about how to, basically how to understand bootloader attack surface. And um, um, this talk basically came together as, uh, as a sort of conglomerate of a lot of like bootloader reviews I did over the last two, two years uh, as part of the contract work that we do. Um, so I'm basically going to talk about bootloaders in a very generic way, talk about some of the architectural stuff that you might expect in a bootloader, talk about how multi-stage bootloaders work. And basically, if you're developing um, something with U-Boot, you're looking at a U-Boot instance, what, what would you want to see that could go wrong? And uh, you know, what, what's like a red flag in terms of a, of a configuration? And then I think um, something I really do is actually talk uh, a bit more extensively about how to fix it. So I've got like a little grid at the end of the talk with six points. Um, some of the more important things I think You've got to pin down to make sure your Ubit instance doesn't uh, give your attackers too much freedom. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Uh, oh, this is not the way <laughs> I expected this slide to go. Anyway, we'll roll with it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's me. Um, I like uh, hiking, fishing, and running. Um, that's my blog. And uh, I started my own security consultancy, trying to help out folks where I can. And um, yeah, I wrote two books. Um, and that's what I look like when I'm hiking. And that's what I look like when I don't hike. <laughs> so yeah, um, I don't want to get too much into this slide. It's always the most boring one. So yeah, um, agenda. What are bootloaders? Um, what's U-Boot? What does a multi-stage boot process look like sort of generically? Um, and then we'll look at some vulnerability analysis of U-Boot. Where do, do U-Boot's bugs typically come from? Um, and uh, how many have there been? Like I've got a nice overview of the reported bugs for U-Boot, um, so yeah, and then a methodology for attacking it and how to secure U-Boot. So, Bootloaders 101, um, why do you even need one? Well, in um, typical embedded setups, uh, uh, most of the ones you'll see today, there's something called a system on chip, and there's local resources inside the system on chip besides the CPU. So you'll have caches, um, static RAMs, this is what SRAM stands for, and you have e-fuses and a bunch of other things. Um, and these are accessible to the stuff that runs first, but most of the OS is not going to be um, accessible in the initial state uh, because the resources are too limited. For instance, the uh, ARM Cortex-M4 only has 0.5 gigs of, uh, of SRAM. You're not going to fit an entire Linux instance in there. Maybe there's some variants of it you can, but it's not rich enough to actually um, give you everything you want. So there's got to be a bridging process from these isolated local resources to the stuff that's stored in your USB, your SD card, and your serial flashes. And um, <clears throat> to some points, uh, you, t you typically have your ROM burned in by the vendor, so there's not much dynamism to it. It does uh, very f a few things. Typically, it will, I'll get into this a bit more, but typically it will do some initial setup. It will uh, check that uh, the local resources are accessible. And sometimes in ROM code, you maybe want to make use of the e-fuses and TPMs. And uh, you also want to host something that's dynamic enough that you can boot multiple OSs off of the other storages. Um, so yeah, uh, quick, quick overview of bootloader types. This is probably very simplified. But there's multi-stage and single-stage. Single-stage are like archaic things. Um, they were usually just, the ROM boots up, loads the OS into memory, and then goes for it. Um, and that usually meant that um, RAM was pretty simple to set up. Um, you only had one kind of RAM. There probably wasn't an MMU. But nowadays, things are a bit more complex. You have multi-stage bootloaders. There's multiple parties um, involved in developing an embedded device. You might have one party that develops your um, first-stage bootloader. You might have a vendor that burns your ROM and some completely other team, uh, another team that builds your OS. They've all got to work together. The only way that works nowadays is to have a multi-stage bootloader. And then there's also um, things like verified boot and trusted computing that complicate matters a little bit. Verified boot is what boot, uh, U-Boot calls secure boot. There's other variants of this in, in other bootloader technology. Um, and basically, verified boot allows you to cryptographically sign and verify um, what you're actually loading on, on your board. 
um, and it prevents, obviously, all the, all the great things that symmetric in cryptography prevents, um, gives you non-repudiation. Non Everyone loves pronouncing that word. Non-repudiation, make sure um, you, you actually have to be authenticated to change the OS. And then obviously there's trusted computing modules that uh, allow you to offload crypto and isolate computation to, to, to uh, more controllable contexts. Um, and just so we have sort of the mind frame uh, correct about how, what kind of goals we have for bootloaders, I break it down to four sort of basic things. There's a lot more that can go in this slide, but you want to boot a verified image. You want to make sure your trusted computing is set up properly. There's no holes. You can't like poke the TPM make it do stuff it's not supposed to or leak bits from it. You want to prevent anti-rollback. Um, one of the things I think in the reviews I've seen is um, typically people will secure a whole, a whole bootloader and not even implement anti-rollback. So that means you can just flash an older version of U-boot with a whole bunch of bugs in and it doesn't really, you don't really gain much ground in, in security, um, bootloader security land. Um, and then obviously the main thing is initialize the kernel securely because at some point it's got to hand over um, uh, the, it's ha got to hand over to the kernel and have every uh, have the um, embedded host set up so that the kernel has access to the resources. It can set up its user space. The MMU is running properly and isolates um, address spaces properly, and all the sort of security rings uh, um, and isolated contexts in, in the board are, ex are working properly. There's no way for the kernel to abuse the bootloader or the bootloader to abuse the kernel. Um, so specifically what we're talking about here is, uh, I mean, there's lots of bootloaders we could talk about, um, but you would, I think, is the most accessible one. It currently runs on something like 94% of all the um, embedded devices you'll see, um, and that's because it's just accessible. I think it's one of the oldest um, products and m supports a, a wide number of, of architectures. There are growing competitors um, to, uh, that are sort of coming up as well, but I think U-Boot's the, the one everyone likes, and it's the easiest to build, uh, as far as I know. So it started out as something called PPC Boot, um, which was a PowerPC um, uh, bootloader, very small, only supported one architecture, and this guy named Wolfgang Denk um, forked it and renamed it, um, mostly because SwordForge doesn't support um, numbers as names, so it used to be called 8XXROM, and he needed to rename it, so he just called it PPC boot. And uh oh, Wolfgang Denk, I think, as far as I know, he passed away last year, October, so um, uh, that's a bit of sad news. I didn't mean to <laughs> say it in a sad way, but just, uh, just as an info point. But yeah, amazing work. Um, obviously, he must have been an amazing guy. Um, and yeah, he released it on SwordForge in July 19, to, uh, uh, 19 July 2000. Two years later, they added ARM support, so PPC boots technically the wrong name for it at that point, because um, it boots ARM as well. And then uh, um, a month, basically a month later, they added a bunch of other support. And by 2004, it was supporting like over 200 architectures and board types. So it grew pretty quickly, um, and a lot of hands, there were a lot of hands in, in making it so accessible, easy to use. Um, so okay, let's talk about uh, sort of the normal boot process. Um, usually what happens is you start off with the ROM boot. It's one of the first thing to execute. And um, what happens here is, again, there's not much to um, access. The resources are limited. And what needs to happen is something needs to get uh, the second stage bootloader, the secondary program, second program loader or secondary program loader into um, RAM that actually fits it. And that's what the ROM, that's the main job of the ROM turns on, finds the SPL, and loads it into um, a, um, appropriate RAM. Additionally, it could also verify the SP SPL. So it has um, some of these, oh, I have another slide where <sighs> this totally defeats the, the animation. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> so what happens is you have something like a serial flash that maybe holds your SPL. It gets loaded into SRAM by the ROM code, and uh, what you could have is uh, in your ETH users, you might have a public key um, that's used to sign the SPL, and, and this is how the verification works. It pulls the uh, public key out and, and verifies it and makes sure it can run. Um, you don't, uh, I don't know if anyone actually uses uh, symmetric cryptography like manually, but you don't typically encrypt the whole thing. You just make a digest of that and you sign hash, and that's a lot faster. Um, so yeah. That's typically what the ROM does. Second stage is the secondary program loader. And um, this, I think, 
uh, basically spins up uh, a lot more of the more complex um, peripherals, touch screens, um, GPIO stuff. You probably want to do this here because um, this, you don't have a lot of power in the in the in the um, in the first boot process. Uh, so it's been verified by the ROM, and its job is to actually um, load the bootloader that loads the rich OS. Um, and uh, that t you can build you can build UBIT as an SPL or TPL. And all it does is it spits out another binary, and you just package it so that, uh, that it can be found by the board, board your, um, your, uh, your booting. Um, and what I've seen also is people like to do anti-rollback checks in the SPL. So it looks at the e-fuses, makes sure that it's burned and checked properly. If you boot a new one, it burns a new fuse, so you can't, you can't roll back for, uh, to, to the previous version. Um, if you're reviewing bootloader code, I suggest you actually check this because it's very easy to skip. Um, anti-rollback checks. And yeah, that's, that's typically the SPL's job. Spin up uh, more peripherals, make sure they're working, verify the TPL and branch a branch to it. And the TPL, pretty straightforward bootloader from, uh, from sort of the kernel. If you work with kernels a lot, this is basically the thing that gets you going. Um, and yeah, it, its job is pretty simple. Just load the kernel, make sure it gets the command line, make sure that um, the MMUs are actually uh, spun up and working properly. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention is uh, external resources have work on clock rates, and there might be multiple clocks on the board. So another thing that ROM does is make sure that the clocks are initialized and that they that they're actually ticking, and we're aware of all the sort of uh, frequencies that we need we need to be operating at. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward boot process. Um, I probably said a whole bunch of things wrong, but you can. Uh, <laughs> You guys can talk to me about it at the end. Um, so where do boot, where do U-boot balls come from? Um, and from what I've learned uh, is, is typically three main sources. A lot of people talk about bootloaders and um, <clears throat> they, I mean the exciting, I think the sexy things to talk about is fault injection attacks or you know these very advanced, um, very advanced uh, electromagnetic like glitching. They're very cool attacks, um, but I think uh, they require a lot of access and typically, they work on very small windows um, that, that the bootloader opens. Um, so th to me, they're like the tip of the iceberg. There's so much other stuff that can go wrong from a security perspective. You could implement your crypto wrong. You could uh, have race conditions in how you're reading your SD card. There's, there's a plethora of issues beyond just uh, skipping a voltage or a clock cycle and um, skipping a instruction. Um, the, other, the other source of uh, VONs is t typically with open source um, um, embedded stuff is drivers. You've got uh, your your um, the, the the people that make your sock are not the people that are making your Wi-Fi chip. They're probably not the people making your flash driver, your MMU. And there's got to be drivers and software that actually runs this stuff. And typically, what happens is it all slaps together pretty fast. Sometimes you get a reference driver in your build which has no security built into it. Just made as an example. And people miss this. So one of the big sources of bugs is third-party drivers. Sometimes they don't even check. Like, you'll see bugs where people load um, firmware into uh, an LCD screen or like a touch screen and don't even verify the touch screen um, firmware because there's so much else going on. Everyone's worried about anti robot checks and uh, uh, um, ASLR being implemented. There's a bunch of stuff that, that, that goes on in th third-party drivers that opens up a lot of bugs. And then notoriously for U-boot, is um, its configuration is driven by setting environment variables. Um, so uh, typically what happens is you don't set the right environment variables for what you're actually um, rolling the board out for. So um, there's a bunch of environment variables. There's a bunch of stuff you need to implement. Um, if, you're, if you're doing TPM stuff, um, a lot of TPM builds don't come with their own random number generators. Sometimes you need to implement them yourself. Um, and you know this type of stuff can go wrong. So I took a sample. I'm going to say it's a sample because um, you know there might be someone reporting a bug in U-Boot right now. Um, but uh, I took a sample of about 35, 37 bugs um, in U-Boot. I think for my effort, that's all the bugs I could find. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is what they look like. So on the on this axis, you'll see a bunch of bubbles. The bubbles loosely reflect how many bugs were reported in that year for that version. And the version is the maximum affected version. So a lot of this data, if you see something affecting the 2009 version, it probably affects the 2018 version too. So as the as the um, it rolls forward, um, 
2014 version, 2010 gets more and more uh, vulnerable, I guess. So 2014, 2017, um, not many bugs reported. Basically, just uh, AES implementation was using a static CBC, uh, a static IV in CBC mode, and there was foot passing bugs. And one thing I think you'll see with U-Boot is uh, because there's a lot of moving parts and it basically passes files, and as you know, um, open source file passes are notoriously like Swiss cheese. They have tons of bugs in them. It's very difficult to pass, pass a file. It's, it sounds simple to find some offsets in a file, but it can go horribly wrong. You can even make a Turing complete file passer if you don't, what are you doing? And that's what happens here. So people, I think, um, if you look at, for instance, uh, 2019, it's a huge amount of bugs reported, about 18. Um, and uh, all of them were NFS. Most of them were network file system bugs. And network file system bugs are basically file parser bugs too. So what it looks like someone just made an NFS fuzzer and aimed it at everything that passes uh, that file system and they found a bunch of U-boot bugs. So really cool stuff. Nice thing about network file system stuff is uh, they might be used to boot files off the network. So if you intercept um, the completely unencrypted TFTP um, traffic that U-boot uses, you can pop a shell um, or probably make U-boot do something it's not designed to do. Um, the other thing is foot image passing. So a foot image is something that holds the device tree um, for U-Boot. It tells you which components are loaded. It has the. It tells you like where the um, public keys are, what's being used to sign it, and um, it's something that you pass U-Boot to tell it where all the non-discoverable components on the board are. Um, and it needs to pass this image. And it turns out there's a bunch of bugs in uh, in the way that it does that too. And then um, the other scary stuff is in 20, 2022, um, there was a bunch of memory corruption bugs everywhere. Uh, well, we only reported, uh, people only reported seven, and they also have to do with file passing adjacent stuff. So the squash FS was, was pretty vulnerable. Um, anyway, I'm tired of talking to this graph. I think the next one's pretty cool as well. Um, so I clustered them according to um, affected area too. Um, so, it's nice to look at like what really causes all the problems. And um, about half the bugs ever reported in U-Boot was from the networking stack. And uh, the typical, so at the bottom, bottom half of the bug, bottom half of the block, you'll see the CWE identifier, um, which is telling you what kind of, of bug was reported. And uh, typical uh, memory corruption stuff because U-Boot is written in C. So you run into a lot of these issues, dangling pointers, double freeze, um, read out, reads out of bounds and copies without size checks, um, which are pretty easy to identify with source code review. So it tells you that not a lot of money going into securing U-Boot, uh, unless it's like your own build. Um, a lot of the public stuff probably doesn't get uh, en enough attention. And um, I think if you're used to reading a lot of uh, bug reports, um, there's a bit of asymmetry. Like on the one side, you have a bug in the USB driver, which is a heap overflow. On the other side, you have tons of bugs in um, the NFS stack and the UDP. You, typically, you'd see U USB as part of the chunk of bugs because it's easier to fuzz for. There's tons of USB fuzzes. So to me, it looks like there's probably a bit more USB bugs in U-Boot because um, 2% doesn't make sense if you have like 50% um, uh, uh, with N NFS bugs. And the rest of it, uh, I think, pretty much handled the uh, file system handling bugs makes sense uh, if, if you fuzz the, the, the NFS stack as well. Um, so, okay, U-Boot's uh, attacking U-Boot as a methodology. So there's four typical steps. You can jump in at either one, um, depending on how you're hitting the board, but uh, typically you'd want to interrupt boot, and um, there's a bunch of interfaces on the board that you could traditionally use. So one of the most common ones is a UART console. Um, they put these on embedded boards, because uh, when you roll out, when you're building a bit board, uh, there's no screens, there's no way to check that it's working properly. Um, I heard this story about this very interesting job someone had um, at, uh, at a, a, when you make bombs, like very dangerous uh, uh, weapons, um, someone needs to test fire these bombs. So, and they've got embedded boards on them. And so they're receiving signals, they're telling you when to trigger, they track the bomb state, did it blow up, is it gonna blow up, should I stop blowing up? Um, that's an embedded device, and so if you if you fire the bomb and it doesn't go off, what do you do? Do you go home? No, someone has to go out, pick up the bomb, drive it away, and then explode that bomb somewhere safely. So that's someone's job. They have to go and pick up a bomb that didn't explode. 
Um, and it tells you a story about how difficult it is to engineer embedded devices sometimes. You can't tell what's going wrong unless you leave some kind of way to, to listen to the device. And, and a UART console is everyone's favorite way to do that. It's a serial connection. I'll show you what one looks like. Um, if you're going to get into um, decompiling, uh, um, into reverse engineering embedded boards, finding UART consoles and hooking up uh, RS-232 to them and seeing if you have a UART trial, it's one of the most fun things to do. Um, I'll talk a little bit how to do that. Other interfaces are things like JTAG. You could, um, you could also pop off some serial flashes, listen to what the flash is doing. Um, and we'll see how to glitch. There's a simple way to glitch a serial flash or um, uh, some, some RAM chips uh, in a second. Very interesting technique. And then there's more advanced stuff like glitching. You can do fault injection or, or, or pin to pwn. Once you interrupt the boot, once you've made sure that the boot process doesn't have what it's expecting, um, typically because of the way U-boot is designed, uh, you might be able to drop a shell. So there's this thing called auto-boot in, in U-boot. And it basically, um, almost like, like a panic design, like if anything goes wrong, drop the shell. And then it gives you access to a bunch of, uh, I'm sure you've all done that. Like I, I grew up, uh, I'm one of those people that always on campus would deal boot windows and Linux because I didn't want to, I didn't want to be with the Windows crowd because they're pretty basic, and I didn't want to be completely in the Linux crowd because they're weird. So I would, <laughs> I would, uh, I would deal boot it, and uh, when you do that, you wake up every morning with your, you know, your heart in your throat, and you go, "Am I going to get the grab prompt or not today?" Like, so, <laughs> so having a having a, a shell in your bootloader is is really good because. It's, a, it's, a, it's called a fail open state. You get access to all these commands and you can manually um, you know, piece together your boot process and, and fire it off. Once you've got a shell, you want to actually modify the boot environment to do interesting things and the interesting thing you want to do is boot a malicious image. So that's a cycle. Um, we'll see uh, what UBoot has to offer in terms of doing this. Um, so yeah, interrupting the boot process, look for serial ports. Um, this is a very shoddy job I did a couple years ago. I think it was like three years ago. This is a typical like Netlink router, and uh, I don't know if you can see the the red border. It's not it's not printed on the board, but those four those four pins uh, are what's a telltale telltale sign for a UART serial console. So you have th four things. One of them's ground, which you need to make sure you identify. I don't think you should ever sort of jack into a board or whatever unless you've identified the ground state first, because you could blow things up. And one of them's the power. Typically, you maybe don't need to power this yourself. Sometimes it uses the board's power. Um, it depends on your situation. And then there's receive and transmit. And uh, once you plug into that, you'll be able to either get a shell, interrupt boot, or it will just dump a whole bunch of diagnostics to make sure you can see what's going on. Um, and in the bottom picture, that's me just ripping like uh, poor Arduino sets, like jumpers, because I didn't have anything else. I, I sold them on and uh, hope for the best. Um, so that's that, that's basic example of serial port. The other way you can interrupt boot, I'm going to talk about this one. This is not me, this is Colin O'Flynn. I think if you get into um, embedded stuff, you'll, you'll know who Colin O'Flynn is. And this is him um, sort of doing a rudimentary glitch of a Philips Hue uh, little smart bulb um, board. And uh, what he does here is he's taking, I think that's like an I. Uh, uh, a JTAG sort of like header, uh, it looks like, and he's taking, pu pulling one of the, um, the there's like a, a RAM chip on top and he's pulling that to ground. The reason he's not doing the serial flash is because uh, he wants the actual serial flash to work, look for the, look for the other RAM chip and then fail. And what happens then is he, it drops a U-boot shell because it's like, well, I can only boot from this RAM, what do I do? It's not there, and it fails into an actual shell. Um, so that's a very simple way to glitch something. I think if you're going to try this, again, make sure you've identified an actual ground port um, and that you're pulling it to the, to the actual uh, uh, ground on the board. It's very dangerous to do this if, 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 you're, if you're not aware which, uh, which pins you're actually using. But very simple to do, very easy to do once you've popped the board open. Try, try, to, try to pull some of the pins to ground, see if it panics and, and gives you a shell. Um, so once you've got a shell, this is what it looks like. This is um, what I built um, in preparation for the talk. Not very realistic scenario, but uh, in terms of U-boot shells, uh, I think it's as real 
Because it needs to be, this is me booting uh, a fresh U-boot build off of uh, key, uh, the Kimu emulator for ARM64. And um, what you can see here in, 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 the top of this, in, in the top of the prompt is it looks for the flash. It does, a, it does just like a normal computer, it'll look for the floppy uh, and the other boot devices. And if it doesn't find that, it falls down to what's called auto boot, as I mentioned. And um, you'll see on the screen it says hit any key to stop auto boot. And at that point, when you're firing up a board, you might want to play with the GPI pins, press some buttons, and it will stop the auto boot and you'll get a shell. And then uh, just because I wanted to be a badass, I, re I recompiled the U-boot and uh, changed the prompt because it's the coolest thing I could think to do for the talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, um, cool. Uh, it's pretty easy to do that. The config uh, environment options is really easy to find. So dropping U-boot shell, what do you do with this? Well, there's uh, typically in, in, in a sort of uh, I'll say a naive U-boot uh, build. There's a bunch of uh, commands that you might find interesting. Modify memory is, is a really cool one. Probably not the first one you'd go for, but modify memory allows you to just change bits in memory or bytes. Um, if you wanted to check whether you could modify the image and then boot it, this is a great one. You'd need to be able to find uh, where your kernel loads, change some bits in there, and see if it actually boots it. Um, Go is great as well, because you can just tell it to start executing from a given address. Um, you can load memory. Um, load, uh, load memory is pretty pretty popular command, and it makes part of a lot of boot scripts because it's typically what they do to make sure the kernel gets in to the main memory, and, and they usually just issue boot r right after that. There's also boot variants, um, boot m, boot z, and boot i, which you can use. And the one I one, one I really like is boot flow, which I'll show you in a second. And of course, there's a bunch of uh, options for booting from the network. TFT boot is one of them. Is two is one of them too. So um, boot flow, um, this is something that's quite interesting. You jacked into a U-boot shell. How do you find out what there is to boot? Like how do you find out what, what you can actually boot and whether there's alternative boot paths? So that's pretty interesting. Is there just one boot path or do they have like some recovery image that you can also boot into? Is it as verified as the, as the main boot flow? Um, what kind of resources um, does the secondary boot path use. And to find that, you basically go boot flow list, and it'll give you a dump of like, what's there to boot. This is obviously like a kind of fake sandbox example. So what it's showing here is the QMU firmware um, boot flow. And uh, once you've got a list of them, you basically select one, you boot, and it starts your kernel. Um, you can actually see the machine tag that I prepared this on that should probably have been sanitized out. Um, <laughs> And then obviously the other way you can boot is uh, network booting. So um, you need to make sure your DHCP is set up. I stole this from another example because this is a nightmare to set up. Um, but yeah, so you set, make your DHCP set up. You have an IP address. Once you have an IP address, you can issue TFTP um, load. It will load into the first argument and you give it the image name. Those little hashes mean that uh, it's actually fetching something from the network and it'll show you how many bytes it, it returned. Once that's done, you can pretty much just issue a boot command, and of your uncle, stuff will start booting. Um, the other thing you can do is check out the other interfaces. So um, MTD is basically your flash, um, uh, flash interface, so it'll list your flash uh, uh, um, cards, and um, you can also read from them, read into them, modify them, and then um, read out of them into main memory and boot from there. So. That's pretty much it. And then before I finish off, I think this is one of the uh, new, newer things I do. I'll, I'll show you how to talk through how to actually fix a U-boot instance uh, according to points I think are more important. So the first thing is to disable um, uh, the command line and the console. And um, the way you do that is in your config, uh, slash configs folder um, for your, your config name, many of them. You can just say disable console no change your boot delay um, to a negative number. And um, the other thing you could do is disable commands. So once you know what you want to boot off of, just make sure you can't access your flash. Why would you have network booting on unless you're going to upgrade? Maybe you want to upgrade the actual image after you've, you've, you've burnt it into production mode. Um, but a really cool thing is to just disable the commands you don't use. Um, the other one is um, make sure you update uh, U -boot, uh, your U-boot build and your drivers. Um, 
Uh, and then, yeah, the other one is, number three is pretty cool. I've seen people um, actually hard code their kernel command lines. This is great because once you boot, pop the U-boot shell, um, it means that, uh, and the way they do this is they actually hard code the boot commands. So U-boot is kind of a DIY project. It's not as uh, polished as uh, other um, open source projects yet, and you actually, you actually have the power to modify commands yourself and add commands. And it's really powerful to just take the boot commands. The boot commands would usually boot anything you want and hard code some options. And if you, if you hard code the command line, you're eliminating a lot of risk because you can't change the way that it inst instantiates the kernel. Um, you can't change the sources it uses. You can't tell it to add a, a, a shell and things like that. The other thing that's really important is if you're doing verified boot, you must make sure that the config uh, uh, disables legacy image formats because some legacy images do not support um, verified boot. So they don't have signatures. And if you don't turn this off when you're booting from a foot image, you can still boot legacy images without verification. Um, obviously, you can disable alternative boot flows. And one thing that I think sometimes slips under the radar, um, especially given the amount of um, memory corruption bugs we see for NFS passes, foot passes, and a bunch of the stuff that are uh, uh, under the U-boot uh, umbrella, um, you should make sure your compiler protections are on. And um, if you're booting a U-boot version lower than, I think, 2010, there's no stack protector support. Um, so one of the cool things you can do now is actually enable stack protector at the U-boot build level and make sure you, you uh, compile position independent uh, as well. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Yes. So, um, I mean, most of the time I'm uh, reading configs for things like Amazon devices. Um, I'm reading things uh, things like cameras, like little IP cameras are pretty cool, and really old routers are very easy uh, to attack as well. That's typically where the devices are. I've, uh, in the past, tried to look at, like, um, USB, password protected, like, USB drives. So, I would try to... There's nothing really running on them. It's just a storage device, but that's sort of the range. IP cameras, um, net, uh, routers, and um, small, smaller embedded devices, I think, some that run minimal um, uh, socks. Yeah. OK, no other questions? Yes. I think you just got to pop that into like a binary ninja on IDA and try to. Yeah, I mean, you, that's, you got to reverse engineer that yourself. I, I don't know where you would get uh, insight on that besides reverse engineering yourself. Okay. No other questions? Cool. Thanks, everyone.